So here we are in Cleveland, Ohio, and we're with Judith Overcash, who's part of the ensemble choir, and we're just really thankful for some time to get to know you and get to know the ensemble. And so, why don't you just tell us a little bit, what's your musical background like? Well, uh, mine is sort of an interesting musical background. Uh, I started singing when I was very, very young. Um, I would sing at uh, county fairs and state fairs and the like. I'm really not making that up. And I had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, I got to high school though, and I auditioned for my high school choir, and the choir director did not let me in to the choir. <laughs> and so I, I took up band instruments, I played a lot of instruments, and I actually intended to start college, or I, I began college as a biology zoology major, and playing instruments on the side. Uh, they then had a form letter sent out to everyone's parents in their freshman year, saying, come join the concert choir in the Glee Club, and it went to my mother, and she said that I should go and audition. And I said, no, I shouldn't. I really can't sing. And eventually she talked me into it. And as I was auditioning, the director of the Charleston Pro Musica happened to walk by. He stuck his head in, said they had just uh, lost one of their sopranos and wanted to know if I could come and sing with their professional madrigal choir. as a professional but university students. And, and so I said, well, let me come and listen to one of your rehearsals and I'll decide then went home, looked up the word madrigal, because I had no idea what it was, and went to one of their rehearsals. It was so wonderful, and I thought, wow, I'd, I'd love to do this, but I have to figure out how to sing. So I started taking a half an hour a week voice lessons. Wow. Then uh, eventually switched my major over to music, and finished up uh, my undergraduate with a concentration in vocal performance, music history, and music education, and then started grad school at the University of Texas in opera. Went there uh, specifically because Danny Johnson was there who also had a very strong early music program and after being there for a little while decided that I really loved early music specifically. So then continued on through graduate school focusing on early music. Indiana University, then Case Western where I finished my master's, rolled into my doctorate and that's where I met Ross. Well, Ross actually brought me to Case Western in the first place. So. Well, that's quite interesting. All the way from a county fair girl singing the national anthem exactly. to doing early music. Mm -hmm. So what is it about early music that gets you so excited? Well, there are a lot of things about it. I, I love the, um, in some ways, the simplicity of medieval music. Um, I love the, just the sound, the way the, the harmonies knit together in Baroque music, um, the way that compositions are built, really, um, all the way from the medieval through the uh, late Baroque period in particular. Um, for some reason, medieval and Renaissance music has a, a real, I really resonate with that music for, for whatever reason. And those styles of music allow a certain degree of freedom to the soloist performer because there is implied the need to ornament music as you go. Um, once you hit the classical period, all of those things are written out for you. Uh, before that, it was the responsibility of the performer, and I like being able to put an individual stamp on every performance that I do. So you mentioned then Baroque improvisation. So mm -hmm. how do you go about putting your stamp on that? Well, gosh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, if you listen to a piece of music, a lot of ornamentation is really tied up with musical rhetoric. Um, the, the laws of verbal rhetoric really apply to musical rhetoric at the time, and so you end up improvising within certain guidelines um, as are appropriate for the style of the music, the period of time, that, that kind of thing. Um, but within those guidelines, there's a lot of flexibility. So you do things that are going to be suited to your instrument, but are also going to help you um, tell the story a little bit better, help you really explain what you're feeling when you sing that particular piece. So, Do you have any suggestions what we should be listening to with Lobet and Heron and what choir is going to be doing, how that may be as an ensemble? Maybe there's some expressive improvisation there that those of us that know some of the repertoire are going to go, oh, that's like, wow, they did that? And <laughs> Well, for the choral music, you don't get to improvise a lot because um, a lot of those pieces, such as Lobet and Heron, are really beautiful, really intricate on their own. And if you if you try and stray a little bit, you're you're gonna 
make things a little too complicated. <laughs> well, we don't want to overcomplicate that, that performance. So you mentioned Ross and a couple others being mentors. How did mm -hmm. they really help your vocal career? Uh, well, my career specifically, Ross is very, very well known uh, in the, the circles of early music. And just by merit of being associated with Ross and with Case Western, um, you find there are a lot of people who have ties back in to Ross and ties back into Case Western. And so it, it really helps you in terms of communicating with and networking with people. Um, there are also a, a lot of people who, um, just in, in this area, it's, it's surprising how many people in and around the Cleveland area really have associations to early music. And they, again, they all tend to tie back to the university. So the relationships that I've had there and have developed there um, in, in every area of music, they always say it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's a little bit of both. So it really helps to be able to contact someone um, and say, hi, you know, my name is Judith. I worked with Ross in this capacity or I worked with this person or this other person in this capacity. At Case Western, I, I understand you worked there as well. Um, I'm putting together this project. Would you like to come and be a part of it? Um, it just helps you make some connections that way, specifically my relationship with Case Western. That's how that has helped my, my career and, and with Ross. So Case has been a real foundation for a long time with you. It has. Um, so tell us, you know, along with your early music study then, and maybe some of what happened with Case, mm -hmm. um, what's some of the favorite solo repertoire out of your early music that you like? Well, my, my definite favorite is um, medieval English music, as uh, Middle English texts. Um, I've, I've done a lot of work on that music. I really love that music. Uh, running a close second is English Lute Song. That's a, again, it's, it's a, another step to the side. <laughs> um, but I love the English repertory in general. Um, but the English lute music um, just has a wonderful texture. Um, a lot of it was written in such a way that it can be sung by voices. It can be sung with a solo voice in lute, multiple voices in lute. Uh, there's a lot of flexibility there. And if you're singing it as a soloist, there's a good deal of the repertory that you can you can improvise to and you, you really can ornament to a certain degree and really make it your own and, and bring it very close to your heart. So do you get to do any of that now in your spare time in between a real <laughs> job and, and being with choir? A little bit here and there, uh, not as much as I would like. Uh, I had to take a little bit of time off a few years ago, sort of got out of the loop a little bit. But um, before that, I was doing quite a bit uh, with different lutenists uh, around the country in different places. And that was, that was really my, my main thing. I really loved to do that. I love doing Baroque music. I love doing other types of Renaissance music as well. Choral polyphony is a, a just a wonderful experience until you have listened to a lot of it. And unless you've had the opportunity to, to really sing a lot of it, um, it's, it's an entirely different world when you get into that polyphonic writing and you're, you're part of that wonderful choral feeling. It's, it's really like nothing else. You have such enthusiasm for it. So for those people maybe that don't have the background that you do, mm -hmm. there's always treasures of composers that people have never heard of. Mm -hmm. So who would you say is maybe an undervalued or under-recognized composer out of the early music scene? Hmm. That's, that's actually a, a fairly difficult question because the, the circles in which, I, in which I travel and the, the people that I know, we all know all of those little composers. And I'm always surprised when I come across, when we're discussing someone and someone says, oh, I've never heard of Schutz or I've never heard of shite, or I've never heard of these. Uh, see, I can tell by your face, you're surprised that people have never heard of Schutz. But it, it's really odd how many people have it. And so it's, it's hard to say who's undervalued because the people that I work with uh, really value all of those people. And so I don't know in, in terms of the, the mass populace who, who isn't valued as much. My, my personal 
favorite is uh, is Hildegard. I love the writing of Hildegard, and again, I'm always really surprised that people haven't heard of Hildegard. So everybody that's watching this now is going to go to Wikipedia <laughs> and look up Hildegard and go, oh, we better be prepared to, to talk with Judith when she comes to Erie, that we know what Hildegard is about. So what are you doing now besides singing with choir? Uh, musically? Sure. Okay. Um, well, uh, singing with choir, I'm actually singing in a, a little Renaissance quartet. Uh, uh, we do a, a couple little concerts here and there, nothing, nothing all that big. I do a lot of local um, theater, musical theater and regular theater, uh, both professional community theater, um, equity, non-equity theater. And um, that really has opened up uh, a whole new world of music for me. It's not music that I really appreciated as much until I started doing those kinds of performances around Ohio in particular. Um, and then I, I do some big band stuff here Wow, what a, what a bag of stuff you've got going <laughs> It's so, a bag of stuff, all right. It, yeah. It's fabulous. What about um, musical theater? What, what are some examples of what you've done recently? Or if you say, wow, I'd like to do that again. Oh, well, um, there are some that are mainstream shows, like uh, Guys and Dolls. Um, I've played Sarah. In Guys and Dolls, but I've also played Adelaide in Guys and Dolls, and Adelaide is probably my favorite musical theater role. Just she's just a wonderful character. There's so much more to her than people think there is. It, unless you've seen the show um, or have been a part of the show several times, you don't understand the character quite so much. There's there's a lot to her. She's fun, and I think that it's. Um, it's important whenever you're going into the musical theater a lot of people think of it as being very fluffy and there's a lot there's a lot of fluff <laughs> there are some roles that are rather weighty and serious there are some the shows are just vehicles for the music not unlike some opera it's all it's all about the music um, but then there are some that have uh, a little bit weightier roles the straight theater that I've done I, I just did um, a production of a show called Early One Evening at the Rainbow Bar and Grill, which is a post-apocalyptic kind of comedy thing. Um, very emotional, very heavy sort of role. Um, but then I did the Christmas Carol rag just after that, which is a setting of the Christmas Carol set to ragtime music in 1910, 1912, New York City. So there's a lot of different types of roles and a lot of different kinds of music. It's just a, it's fun. It's really fun. Yeah. So people in Cleveland get a lot of opportunities to hear your voice in a whole different realm from doing the early chanson all the way up to the latest Sondheim lyric that's going on. Yeah, like it or not, I'm doing <laughs> I'm around in a lot of different ways. So when you're not in public, what mm -hmm. are you singing? I'm singing a lot of um, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s in the car. I sing a lot of Sinatra and Rosemary Clooney in the car. Um, and then, again, I'll, I'll be singing a lot of chant. I'll be uh, just walking down the hall. It's, it's great if you're in a wonderfully resonant place and you find that you're alone and there's no one listening. And you can sing a little bit of chant here and there and listen to it ring in the room. It's, it's kind of fun. If anybody walks in, they think you're a little crazy, but... <laughs> well, we look forward to having you in Erie, and there's lots of resonant spaces we can show you around, and we'll get you to let that voice loose a little bit. Oh, lovely. That would be wonderful. Thanks for your time, Judith. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much. <laughs>